Lent here at Mount Auburn this season is all about the journey, the way to the cross. Wednesday nights, um, some of you were there. Our first opening, we're, we're having people you meet along the way. And it was a great opening. It was incredible. And each week we are going to be meeting here and, and meeting people Jesus met on the way to the cross. Our devotional is the way back to God, the road back to God. Sunday mornings, it's all about the journey, the journey to the cross. Today is, is fun because we're going to learn uh, the rules of the road. What are the, what are the rules we're supposed to keep on this road? But I want you to watch this as we travel. This is a picture of what we're going to be doing for Lent. And as we talk about today, let's see where this goes. We're going to go to Matthew 22. And if you put up Matthew 22, we're going to start right here with verse 36. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, the, the road to the cross, the, the way home is a, is a mighty road you ask each of us and all of us to, to, to go with you as we head this way. So now let's gather, Lord. Open up our hearts and minds together. Let's gather together as we seek to follow you on this way. It's time for our journey. It's time to go. So, Lord, open us up that we may hear, see, know, experience you. Jesus, in, in your name we pray. Amen. It's probably Tuesday of Holy Week. Jesus is about to be arrested. Crucifixion's coming. It's almost Friday. This is his last chance. It's the last debate. Different groups have been coming at Jesus trying to break him down. We had the Herodians. We had the Sadducees. And now we have the last group, the Pharisees. Do you know the Pharisees were the closest ones to Jesus? They, they, they agreed with each other in theology. They believed in the supernatural. They believed in angels. They believed in the authority of Scripture. They believed in the power of God to, to move supernaturally. They believed that. And they believed and knew they needed a Savior, a Messiah. They believed this. But they didn't know what to do with Jesus. He wasn't who they were expecting. It's now. Jesus is in the temple area. The place is full. It's, th it's thriving. It's about time for the Passover Thursday night. Hundreds and thousands of people have been coming into Jerusalem. And at this point, the Pharisees met... Everybody else has decided no more questions, but the Pharisees said, we're not giving up. We're going to see if we can trip them up. And here's the question that came. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And going on. Now, you got to remember, this question was not a surprising one. They debated this question all the time. There are 613 different commandments Laws, pardon me, that the Jews had to keep. And many of them believed if you could find the, the most important one and use that as a, a grid, a, a way to look at all the other laws, that would make it easier to keep all the laws. They talked about it. They debated this. It was common debate in, in their meetings. But it's also a test. They're testing Jesus to see how he'll respond. They think they can get him on this question. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Now stay with me on this one for a minute. He's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. It is the Shema. Every child learned this. This is what every Jewish boy and girl would know. He said, I'm, I'm not going to answer you with one of the commandments, one of the laws. He knows if he does, he's going to come down to their level and they're going to start arguing about which law is really the best 
He, he says, it's not about keeping the laws. What's important here, and I need you to understand, he loves the Pharisees. He loves the Sadducees. He loves the Herodians. He loves all of them. He wants them to know him. And he comes back and says, look, you've missed the point. It's not about just keeping the law. It's about the heart. It's about what's going on inside of you that makes all the difference in the world. He said, listen, don't you remember this from childhood? The most important thing you learn, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Now, before we go on from here, I want to open this up a little bit. The word love here is the word, it's the verb form of the word agape. And it's, it's love with action. All the way through scripture, this word, this concept, you can't talk about love without action. It's got to be acted on. It's got to be you can't say you love something if you don't move on it. you got to do something about it. Not because it feels right, but you're compelled. It, it just pushes you to do it. Love the Lord. The Lord, the one that you, that you put yourself under his authority. I'm, I'm obedient to my Lord. I put myself under him. Love the Lord. Now, I want you to look at something with me. I learned in seminary when... The most, one of the most important things you can look at when you're reading the text is if something's repeated. I want you to count with me how many times the word your is here. Okay? Ready? Love the Lord. That's one. God with all. That's two. Heart and with all your. Oh, I did three. And with all. Four times the word your here is repeated. When something's repeated like that, we've got to look at why. It's about a relationship. When I talk about your something, it means you have a relationship with that. Now, except when I'm talking about our children, I say they're your children. <laughs> Everybody understands that. They're your children, not my children. No. But, but when you say your this isn't the God. This isn't about God doing something. This is your God. A God who knows you, knows you by name, knows you. And it puts you in relationship with him. Love the Lord, your God. It's not about rules. It's about a relationship. Now look, how do I do this? These rules of the road. This is really Jesus saying, you want to know rules? Here are the rules you got to keep. But these are the rules of the road I walk on. Love the Lord, your God. How? With, now, three times the word all is used. In Scripture, the Hebrew mind, when they say something, they often will repeat it and say it in a little bit different way just to emphasize it. And often it's a third time said. If you go through Psalms, this is a pattern you find all the way through Psalms, for example. Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart. All your mind and all your strength, pardon me, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. You go to Matthew, he adds strength into it. But what's the point of that? The point of Jesus is saying, with everything you are, you love the Lord your God. But notice something. All of these words don't, aren't laws. It's not what I do. It's what I think. It's what I feel. It's what I dream. It's what I hope for. It's what I long for. Jesus is saying you miss the point if you're just worried about keeping rules and laws. Real faith, real life starts in here, in your own heart, in your own mind. Whatever I choose to do, believe in my mind, whatever I choose to understand in my heart, from that comes everything else. And Jesus says, I want you to love God. With everything you think, everything you feel, everything you hope for, everything you imagine. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Going to that next slide, he says, this is the first and greatest commandment. It's not about keeping the commandment. It's about loving God with everything you are. Then he goes on and says, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, the second is like it. That means the second, this one, is equal to the first. The first one has to go first, but the second is, is, is like it. 
You can't do the second without the first, nor can you do the first without the second. You got to have both. You want to know the rules of the road? He says, you want to follow me on this road we've been talking about? Love God with everything you are, everything, everything inside you, and love your neighbor as yourself. By the way, it's one thing to love God with all that I am, everything I think, feel. But then it says, love your neighbor as yourself. That means I've got to care for my neighbor as I'd care for myself. That means I've got to feed the hungry. That means I help them when they have need, when they can't carry what they're carrying. Think about all the ways you need help and I need help. That's what that means. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, these are the rules of the road. Now, going on to 40. Can I tell you, this is a powerhouse verse. And I hope this verse rocks you. All the law and the prophets, all, all the laws, all 613 laws, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Think about that, all of them, on these two commandments. Now going on, at this point, Jesus does something that he has not done before. He pivots the table. He's used to receiving questions. They've come to him. Herodians have come to him with the question. Sadducees have come to him. Now the Pharisees come to him. And now he turns the table on them. He says, I've got a question for you. This is fun. Uh, This part is fun. Hang on. Here we go. While the Pharisees are gathered together, they're all there in the temple. There's all these people were there in the temple. While the Pharisees were gathered together, and they're all talking about, who's got another question for this guy? Doesn't somebody have a question? We've got to trip this guy up. They're still talking. And Jesus just says, guys, I've got a question for you. What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? Now, with one voice, they respond, the son of David. I want you to get a sense of something. I'm going to say, whose son is he? I want all of us together at the same time say, the son of David. Okay, here we go. Whose son is he? The son of David. Now imagine a thousand people said that. They know who the Messiah is supposed to be. He is a direct descendant of David. All the promises of God show that. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. We can go through all the different things. Whose son is he? He's the son of David. The truth of the matter is, they're correct, but it's not complete. A partial answer means you fail, guys. This is really serious stuff. It's it's truth, but it's only half right, because you don't have the full answer. This is so important, and I need you to see that his heart is that Jesus gives an open book test. Think about it. It's teachers. He gives an open book test. He gives them the answer by what he's about to say, because he wants everybody to pass. Everybody. Now, going on, he says to them, and this is, he's going to blow their minds right here. Hang on, he's going to really, he's going to go somewhere they've never, they've never gone. He, Jesus says to all these Pharisees and all the people, the crowd listening in, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, now you need to understand something here. The Pharisees believed in the inspiration of Scripture that God would work with an individual to get down on paper what needs to be done. So when David wrote the Psalms, and he's getting ready to quote from Psalm 110, that isn't just David's good ideas. Somehow the Holy Spirit is working with David in together, and what's printed here is what God wants us to have. You with me? This is really important. You got to know this. He said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord, the Messiah? Because this doesn't make it, you know, he's going to go for it. For he says, Now let's look at the verse. Now, the Lord said to my Lord, let me stop here. In the oldest Hebrew versions of this text, it's Yahweh said to my Lord. These, so the first one's definitely God, Yahweh. 
So Yahweh, God, said to my Lord. Now we know that Lord can't be a second God. You, Hebrews would never stood for that. They have one God, and that was so critical to it, to them. Second, the Lord said to my Lord, who is he talking? He's not talking about his son. If this is the Messiah, that doesn't make sense. A father would never call a son Lord. It, it, that's not, that would not have happened. What do we do with this? The Lord said to my Lord, David is saying he's under authority of this one. Who could it be? Yeah, it's the Messiah. But this one's also showing that this one is God. Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under my feet. Going on. Jesus asked this question. If then <clears throat> David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? He's raising this issue. This isn't just about a human being that David's talking about. He's talking about this one who's to come, this Messiah. He's more than just the son of David. And so he asks the question, how can he be his son? Now going on to 46. No one could say a word in reply. The Pharisees got what they were talking about. They didn't agree with it, but they got it. For the first time, I think they began to see that Jesus is claiming not just to be the Messiah, the son of David. He's also claiming to be the son of God. But he has been teaching that all the way through his life. He's the one that can forgive sins. He's the one who spoke and all nature responded. That's who he is. He is the son of man and the son of God in one. No one could say another word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. No more debate. That's it. This, he has the last word here. And the last word is, I am the son of man. You betcha I am. I'm a direct descendant of David and all the promises of God, but I'm also the son of God. The same one that the father talks about when he says, this is my son with him. I am well pleased at his baptism and at the transfiguration. So where is this journey of Lent taking us? See, it's one thing to know the rules of the road. And basically, we all know what we're called to do. We're called to love like Jesus, aren't we? We are called to love with all that we have. And we're called to love our neighbors as ourselves. But do you ever think about the fact, in those words, Jesus fleshed those words out for us? If you don't know what that means, if you don't understand what it means, say love God with everything you are and love your neighbor as yourself, look at Jesus. He came from heaven, his choice. He gave everything he had, his body, his blood, his, himself, go to that cross for us. Why? So that we can be in relationship with him. He took our sins so we could know him better. That's what love is about. That's what he's talking about. But I want to challenge you something. It's one thing to know the, the rules of the road, and I think we all need to know that, that I've got to love like that, and I've got to love my neighbor like that, and that only can happen through the power of the Holy Spirit. But here's the point of all this. Where is the road going? Where is this road heading? The road is going to Jesus. Yeah, the cross is just here. I mean, you can see the cross from right where we're standing, but the cross doesn't, st that's not the end. There's an empty tomb coming. And just past that empty tomb is Pentecost. Boy, look out what's going to happen. The point is, this road leads to Jesus. All the way through Lent, here's the question. This is the question he's asking the, the Pharisees. Who do you say that I am? This is the question he's asking us. Who do you say that I am? You can call me a Messiah, and that's true, but that's not a complete answer. That's a, in a pass-fail, you're going to fail with that one. You can call me a Savior, and that's true. That's not enough. You can call me a good teacher, and that's true. But that's not the right answer either. The right answer is, I am truly the Son of Man. I, all the promises in the Old Testament are fulfilled in me, but I'm also the Son of God. I'm fully man, fully God, 100% both. And in me, all salvation rests. Everything is. And the question, the only, I can get wrong many questions in this life. 
I, I can answer incorrectly many, many questions in my life, and I have. But there's only one question I can't miss. Because my whole eternity rests on it. And the question's really simple. Who do you say Jesus is? Is he the Lord, the Savior, the Messiah? Truly is he God, the Son of God for us? Is he everything he's promised to be? How you answer that question determines your destiny, your hope, your everything about it. And so Lent, every day of Lent, everything we're doing is really asking this question, who's Jesus in you today? And not just who is Jesus, how does your life answer that question? It's one thing to say, I, you know, I believe Jesus is, is the Messiah and that he's the Son of God and he died for me. But does your life show that? Does your life speak that to others? A disciple of Jesus, someone who's walking with them on the road, your life is going to show that answer in everything you do. So again, I ask the question, who is Jesus to you? How are you going to answer that question? How would others who watch you answer that question? Because this is, this is all that matters. Nothing else does, guys. I want, and he wants everybody to get into heaven. He wants everybody to answer that question. It's open book. I mean, he says, I'll give you the answer. All you have to do is trust me. Believe in me. Follow me. I'll take you. Not just to the cross. I'm going to take you to the empty tomb. Not just to the empty tomb. I'm going to take you all the way home. But it starts with this question. Who do you say that I am?